All right. Let's uh, do this first. We'll open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll get into our workshop. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your continued blessing on us in your word. And we thank you, Lord, that the holy word of God matters for all of life, including our marriage. Uh, those of us that are married or will be married, I pray, Lord, that you would help us, encourage us from your word, and help us to uh, live it out that much more for your glory. We thank you for this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on in wherever you can find a seat. Join us. We appreciate you guys coming today. As a, This session is a encouragement as it relates to principles in marriage. Uh, and let me encourage you, please realize this is not just for those who are married, but can be for those who are considering marriage as well. Um, as well as for those of you that maybe want to minister to others in marriages. It's no surprise that in our culture today, the issue of, of marriage is, is a grave concern. Um, we see divorce happening at an alarming rate, both in church and outside in the culture. And so that much more, we as Christians need to be guided by God's word. So I encourage you to uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 5, as we have probably one of the greatest... Um, areas of information in God's word regarding marriage, both for the husband and for the wife. Uh, so come on in, have a seat. Uh, we won't look at you all, you know, not make you feel too uncomfortable. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I was just saying to the group here, this, this is for preparation, principles in marriage for those who are married and those who are considering marriage as well. And so our encouragement out of the book of Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to start together and uh, read through some of these ideas. Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and the two sh shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. But I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. This is an interesting uh, encouragement that I've been trying to uh, convince my kids about, help them understand something. I said this to uh, a couple of my kids uh, a while ago. I said that, you know, when we get to heaven, mom and I won't be married anymore. My kids looked at me like I had a third head on or something like that. They were, they were shocked. They were, in fact, one of them was upset at me. Dad, why won't, she, why won't she be your wife anymore? What's wrong? I said, nothing's wrong. It's just when we're in heaven, we won't need marriage anymore. I don't need to wear this wedding ring. And they were trying to understand. They were quite upset at me that we're not going to be married anymore. And I take that from scripture. If you remember that, that portion in the Gospels where Jesus says, in heaven there is neither giving or receiving of marriage. And I was trying to help them understand, you see, that marriage, this side of heaven, here on earth, is intended to be a picture of what God is with the church. The husband is the leader, is the provider, is the one who loves the wife. The wife is the one who joyfully submits to the loving direction of it. Well, that's supposed to be like God and the church. God, through Christ, is the head of the church. He's the one who leads us and encourages us. And we, the church, submit to his loving leadership. Marriage on earth is a picture of the reality in heaven. But when we're in heaven, we won't need the picture anymore because we're with God. Do you understand? 
it, it would be like me taking, taking a picture of my wife. Let's say I have my, my phone with me here and I have a picture of her on my phone. And I look at it when I'm away from her and I think, oh, I miss her, I love her, I pray for her, I look at this picture. But how silly would it be if all of a sudden my wife walked in and I kept on looking at the picture? <coughs> oh, hi, dear, how are you doing? Oh, this picture of you is so wonderful, right? No. The picture is good, but it's not as good as the reality. The picture helped me remember the reality. And I think what Paul is saying here in the book of Ephesians is that marriage is incredible, is made by God, and is wonderful for a husband and wife to enjoy each other. But its ultimate intention is to be a picture of how God loves the church through Jesus Christ. The picture is great, but the reality is even better. But on this side of heaven, until that day, we need some help as it relates to this thing called marriage. We wanna help the picture look good, not just for our own good, but for his glory. And so that's what this seminar really is about. It's intended to help us make the picture of marriage in our culture today something that reflects the glory of God. And I think we all need help with that. Again, whether you are married or whether you're considering marriage or whether you're thinking of helping others in their marriage. The Lord has blessed me a lot in my work as a, as a therapist. I get to help a lot of couples both before marriage and during marriage as they try to struggle through some of the issues of living on this side of glory and this most intimate relationship of marriage. Maybe the Lord is calling you to do some of that within your local churches or communities. I hope some of this can maybe help with that. And so this is how I'd like to go with us um, this morning here. Um, I, I'm really going to be pulling a lot from a book called Love and Respect. Has anyone ever read this book before by Dr. Emerson Egrich? A couple of you have. My encouragement to the rest of you, get this book. Incredible resource written by this individual. His wife helped him as well. And the main point of his message in this book, we believe love best motivates a woman and respect most powerfully motivates a man. But understand, Dr. Egrich did not make this up. He's the first one to admit this is not his idea. He pulled this specifically from a verse in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, the verse that we just read. However, let each one of you, he's talking to the husbands here, love his wife as himself. Husbands, love your wives. And... Let the wife see that she respect her husband. Wives, respect your husbands. Dr. Egridge looked at that and he realized this is the command of God for marriage. Why aren't we using it? We have all these seminars, all these books, all these ideas of how to save marriages when the truth is given to us simply and plainly in God's word. Here's the thing that he did though. He realized that these realities of love and respect work in tandem with each other, meaning they complement. It's not just that the husband just loves and hopefully that works out. And it's not just that the wife respects and hopefully that works out. No, in fact, the love of the husband helps the wife and the respect of the wife helps the husband. They work together. In fact, this is the way that he talked about it, that when the husband uses his love, when he shows his love to his wife, what it does, it motivates his wife. What does it motivate her to do? Well, it motivates her to respect her husband. And when she respects her husband, you know what the husband wants to do more? He wants to love more. And when he loves more, do you know what the, do you see the whole cycle starting here, right? When he loves her, she respects him, and this wonderful, energizing cycle of marriage to the glory of God starts happening. Now, in fact, this can work the other way as well. In fact, I've worked with a lot of guys um, in their marriages where they say, listen, I can't love this woman God's given me. It's kind of like what Adam said in the garden. You remember that? When they've sinned and God's looking for them, and what's Adam's first response? The woman you gave me kind of blames God, right, for this woman. And I've heard guys say that. This woman, I just can't love her. She's not lovable. And we'll get to that. We'll talk about how to love in those situations. But the reality is when he doesn't love his wife, when a husband does not show godly love, sacrificial love for his wife, she reacts. 
She is offended. She gets hurt and she reacts. You know how a wife reacts to a husband that doesn't love her? She doesn't respect him. And you know what happens when she doesn't respect a husband? He doesn't want to love her. And you see the crazy cycle starting in a bad way. That when he doesn't do what he doesn't do, she doesn't do what she should do. And it keeps on getting uglier and uglier. And I've worked with husbands and wives and wives who say, well, I can't respect him. He's not respectable. Or he says, I can't love her. She's not lovable. And they get caught up in this wicked cycle of selfishness. Instead of taking what God's word says and applying that to see the energy of God's glory being revealed in this picture of marriage. This, to me, is a wonderful encouragement. And so the way in which they talk about this is in two ways. All right. We're going to take a look at aspects as it relates to women in this acronym called couple. And, and in fact, while I do have an image of a woman up there, uh, a, a while ago, my son and I, we were at a restaurant and we were, he wanted to go to the bathroom. So we went down and he saw, he saw the two bathrooms, right? He saw the guys and the girls. And he looked at this one. No, it's my daughter, actually, Ainsley. And, and she looked at this and she said, Dada, why do women always wear capes? <laughs> oh, I said, dear, because they're superheroes in my book, right? She is wearing a cape, just for the record, of course, right? But for, for, while this is about women, this encouragement is actually for you husbands, all right? We're going to talk about each one of these. Things in which you can do, husbands, to show love to your wife. And guys, I'm starting with you because God calls you to be the leader. You need to take the first step of leadership in showing your love to your wife through closeness, through openness, through understanding and peacemaking, through loyalty and esteem. And we're going to look through each one of these and show how God's word encourages us to show these things. How you husbands can show your love through these things. But it takes two to tango, as the old saying goes. And so sure enough, we want to see the things that are needed for men. That wives, there are things that you need to do to show respect to your husbands. As it says there in verse 33. In terms of conquest and hierarchy, authority, insight, relationship, and sexuality. And we need to understand, again, these concepts specifically are not taken from Ephesians 5, but I think Scripture does highlight these ideas to inform us as it relates to these two big ideas. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands and how they work together. So that's what we want to get into this morning and try and appreciate some of these things. Um, let me just say, too, I have a lot of people ask if they can um, get my PowerPoint or are interested in getting some of the information. Um, I didn't put my email up address up on there, but it's B as in boy, Matthew, M-A-T-H-U-W, at Emmaus, E-M-M-A-U-S dot E-D-U. B Matthew at Emmaus.edu. If you're interested in any of my materials, either from the workshop or even from the plenary sessions, I would be happy to send that to you. Uh, just send me an email and uh, be happy to send any and all of that information to you. Again, my hope is that it helps you, but also gives you the opportunity to minister to others as well. So please know I would be happy to do that. But I want to start with talking to the men. All right, we're going to be talking specifically about what you can do for the women, as it were. But really, this first section is for you husbands. It's for you men who may be husbands in the future. And may I encourage you that even if God does not call you to marriage, I think, understand, singleness is a valid and holy option for some of God's people. Out of the three major monotheistic religions of, of Islam and Judaism and Christianity, you know Christianity is the only one that celebrates singleness. Singleness is a good and holy, valid option for some. This is the way I often say it. It is normative for most Christians to get married. But it is not abnormal for some to stay single. We should not ostracize those who feel the Lord's calling on their life is to be single, as Christ himself was, as Paul encouraged in the epistles. But it is normative. It is the norm for most to get married. And so we need to understand. So this first part really is for the guys. Whether you are married, are thinking about getting married, or want to minister to others in their marriage. One of the first things in which you can do to show your love to your wife is to be close. Now, I am not just talking about physical closeness. That's definitely part of it. 
But we need to come back to this central passage in the book of Genesis, right? Therefore, a man shall leave his father. Let me ask you this question. I'm going to try and get this to be a little interactive here since we've got a smaller group. What does it mean, in your opinion, when you read this passage, for an individual to leave? When you hear that in Genesis, that they are to leave, what does that mean? How, how do you understand that concept? And I think the major idea that's given into context here, a man shall leave his father and mother, right? That all of a sudden, and we all understand this, right? We all grew up as kids under a household, and we were under the authority of a mom and a dad, right? The reality is that when th this man and this woman come now into a marriage, they are under a new authority. This is the way I also say it. When a man and woman come together in marriage, that's a new family, Family is not defined by children. Family is enhanced by children. What I mean by this is, children are a wonderful blessing, but that's not how family is defined. There are men and women, husbands and wives, who don't have any children, but make no mistake, they are a family. Children are a wonderful blessing, but there are some families who can't have children for whatever reason. That doesn't make them any less of a real family because what's happening is that the man has left his household, the woman has left her household, and now they are coming together. They are leaving one community and cleaving. Now, let me ask you the next question. When you hear the word cleave, what comes to mind? My third grade teacher said, when you're brainstorming, you can never be wrong. So let's just brainstorm a little. I'll let you know if you are wrong. But nevertheless, when you hear the word cleave, what comes to mind? Cutting, it definitely comes to mind. Not something I encourage within marriage. <laughs> Brother, you were about to say? It's a cling, right? I, I, even the idea of a cling wrap comes to mind, right? You ever tried to take cling wrap off and put it on, and it starts getting all mushed up together, and you're like, forget this, I'll just get a new piece, right? There is this idea of clinging together. I remember in junior high, I had an art teacher who was trying to teach us how to do pottery. And she said to us, when you want to take two pieces of clay and have them joined together, what you do is you take the clay on one side and you make these hash marks. And you take the clay on the other side and you also make hash marks. And what you do is you cleave them together. And I heard her say cleave. I'm like, that's in the Bible, right? She's like, okay, put your hand down, right? And, and what they do is they put those pieces together. They put it in the kiln and they fire it up. And essentially what happens, those two pieces, because they've been cleaved, and in fact cutting is actually part of that, the idea is that the two are now one. It's actually a pottery term. It's really interesting. And the idea early in scripture is that this idea is that they're leaving the authority of their past homes to make a new authority as husband and wife. They don't lose their identity, by the way, right? A husband is still who he is. A wife is still... I remember at our wedding reception, a friend of mine, his name's Jack, he was the MC at our, our wedding reception. And he was introducing all the, the people in our party. And he finally got to us and he finally said, and now introducing for the first time, Benna. <laughs> My wife's name is Jenna. My name is Ben, and in his mind, he just kind of put the two together. Benna. I don't know if he's trying to save time or what, but we're not Benna. It's not some type of like Bragelina or anything like that, right? I'm me, she's her, but there is a uniqueness now to our relationship. And I would argue that scripture itself encourages this within a very interesting way. Look what it says here in Deuteronomy. When a man takes a new wife, he shall not go out whether it be in battle, whether it be out in the field, whatever he's doing, he shall be free at home for a year to watch ESPN and play Xbox <laughs> is not what the text says. You know why he takes a year off? And give happiness to his wife. Hear how it's phrased, though. It's not encouraged that the woman, you take a year off and give happiness to. No, the encouragement is for the husband to make a move towards your wife. Why? Because your wife wants that closeness. Oftentimes when I'm working with couples, I draw this line for them. I encourage them to, to understand that there is a difference between men and women when it comes to the ways in which we interact with people. 
generally speaking, this is not for every guy, not for every girl, but generally speaking, out of independence and involvement, can you guys guess where guys usually end up on the spectrum? Independence, right? Listen, for those of you that are married, that may have children, you come home at, after work. Guys, would you be willing to be a little honest with me? What's said in workshop stays in workshop, unless it's recorded and it'll go out to everyone, all right? Um, when you come home from work, what do you want to do when you come home after a long day of work? Kick back. Kick back. What are some of the ways in which you kick back? Watch ESPN and Xbox, that's one way, yeah? And what are some other things? Read a book. Maybe seclude yourself into your man cave and get away from all those crazy kids that have infested your house, right? Uh, whatever it is, guys, generally speaking, want to detach when they've been in community. Can I tell you, one time I was driving home and I was listening to this radio station, this Christian radio station, and as I'm literally driving into my garage, the guy on the radio is saying, remember, men, when you come home, recognize you're not done your work. That was really good. Because in my mind, I've been working eight hours, right? And now I want to take it all, I want to take a break. But understand, I'm not just leaving my main work, I'm coming to my main work. Not just with my children, but first and foremost with my wife. My wife, who herself has been engaged in all kinds of activity or work, whatever she is, but this primary relationship is for me to remember that I need to connect with my first job, my first ministry, my first love with my wife. Guys, you need to take those moments to engage with your spouse and to encourage her in a way. I don't know if you heard the story of a, an older couple that one time went out to have dinner and they were sitting there and they look at another table and they see a young couple sitting beside each other, all lovey-dovey. The husband has got his arm around her and he's whispering sweet nothings into her ear, caressing her hair. And, and the older wife is seeing this lovely couple going on and how much love they are showing. And she, she looks at her old husband and says, dear, look at that young couple. Look how much, look how much love they're showing to each other. He's, he's showing all kinds of love to her. Why can't you do that? To which the husband looks up from his food, looks at the woman and says, I don't even know her. Why would I do that to her? <laughs> That's not what she's asking, fella, right? She wants connection. She wants closeness. And sure enough, it starts with physical, but it's emotional. It's spiritual. She wants you guys to be close. So lead. Show her love by stepping in. Stepping into her life and being close to her. I think that's what is involved in this. All right. Let me say this as well. As we're going through this, if, if a question pops up, if, if a comment comes to mind, I really want to encourage you to be willing to engage with me as we go. If not, even afterwards, I'd be happy to stick around and talk for those of you that are interested as well. But please, if you do have a thought or question, I'm happy to address it as we go through here. All right. So let's get to the next one here. Openness. She wants you to open up to her. Interesting verse out of Song of Solomon. My darling, my very own, my flawless dove, open the door for me. Now we know the metaphors that are used here in Song of Solomon as it relates to the physical love, but I think it's also emotional. I think it's the intimacy between this man and a woman. But understand, I think this is more than just opening up yourself physically. Understand again, guys, generally speaking, when we struggle with things, we like to keep it in. And may I say, it's not just struggle. Sometimes even when we get excited about things, we generally like to keep it in. My, my wife knows me very well, and she realized I'm the kind of guy, let me just say it this way, I could never win at playing poker because I can never bluff. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. You know, you've heard that expression before. Like if I get three aces, I'm like, nothing, right? I, 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 I'm constantly, and so when my wife sees that I'm upset about something, and especially like when we're in a, in, a, in a public situation, and she can just read me, and she'll ask me this question, what's wrong? You know what the worst thing I can do at that say? Nothing, I'm fine. Can I tell you, at that moment, I've just crushed my wife's spirit. 
because she is asking for me to open up. And in my unwillingness to share with her my struggles or my joys at that moment, I've lost an opportunity to connect and show love to my wife. I am not saying, guys, that you need to share every single problem, every single moment, that you should be texting your sweetheart every single day, I just got a boo-boo on my toe. I don't think that's what she needs to hear, all right? But I am saying that when there are real struggles or real joys that you are experiencing in your life, guys, open up. Share that with the, the love that God has put into your life. This is a way in which we can be open with them. Sh discuss concerns. Share hopes. Remember joys. Pray together. Can I tell you, oftentimes when I'm, I'm mentoring young men at the college and they're starting to date a young woman and they're looking for advice and things like that, they're asking, should I start praying with her? And I said, you know what? Hold off. Because when you start praying with somebody, as I believe it should be, especially when there is an emotional, perhaps romantic connection there, you start opening yourself up in ways that may be problematic this side of marriage. But on the other side of marriage, you know what I'm constantly having to remind guys to do with their wives? Pray with them. <laughs> because prayer should open up your heart with your spouse. Prayer should open up your mind and all the joys and sorrows that you're experiencing. It's funny, before marriage, guys want to pray with girls all the time. After marriage, I never want to pray with them. My encouragement to you guys is open up. Be willing to open your heart to your wife. Oh, here's a one that this really hits me where it's at, all right? The you of understanding. Don't just try to fix her. Try to listen. This is an interesting passage out of 1 Peter chapter 3. Live with your wives in an understanding way. I, I find it interesting. I read this in a commentary. Peter does not say, live with your wives because you can understand her. Because good chance you are not. And that's okay. But Peter's encouragement to the men is, try. <laughs> try to understand her. And not just to try and solve the problems, but to help them. And I find this interesting. And again, I say I struggle with one, one particular because we as guys, we like to fix things, right? Last week, my son's glasses broke. And we were at my parents' house, so I didn't have access to my, you know, tools and war chest and everything, right? And so I'm scrummaging around my parents' house trying to figure out, and I found some this, and I found some that, and I do that. If you see my son Elias with his glasses on, ask him to see the fixed glasses, because those things will never break again, all right? I found, like, the cement-bonded glasses now. I love doing that kind of stuff, right? Plumbing goes out, I want to try and fix it. A car is starting to fiddle, it freaks my wife up, but I like to try and fix it, right? We're, we as guys, generally speaking, we like to fix. Throw into that that I'm also a licensed counselor, and that's my job. I work with people to figure out their problems. But can I tell you, when I go home, my wife doesn't need a therapist. <laughs> She's not just looking for me to fix things. She's not looking for a fix. She, oftentimes, she's just looking for an ear. She's looking for a shoulder to cry on. Now, there may be a point where you need to step in and help with this situation, but can I tell you, oftentimes, husbands, what your wives need when they're struggling is just someone to talk to. Not someone to try and fix, not someone to try and rationalize and analyze. They just want to talk it out. <laughs> and that's hard for us as guys because we want to then fix it. May I encourage you to take the encouragement of James? I added the wise husband part, but I think it applies here. A wise husband should be quick to listen, slow to speak. May I encourage you, when your wife is struggling with something, understand one way in which you can show love to her men is to be quick to listen and slow to speak. She doesn't just need a fix, she needs your ear. She may need your shoulder to cry on as well. But my encouragement is that you see that. Remember the story in, uh, in 1 Samuel, when Hannah finds out that she is barren? And you remember, I mean, that's a hard situation for women today, but how much more thousands of years ago, when women who were not able to have children were considered to be a social outcast, and Hannah finds out she is barren. Do you remember what her husband said to her to try and fix the situation? Why are you so downcast? Am I not better to you than ten sons? You know essentially what he was saying to his wife as she was struggling? Dear, don't worry. You got me. 
That's a, that's a fix of, a, of an attempt, right? It's not what Hannah needed to hear, I would argue. She was barren. She was struggling. She was sorrowful. Instead of trying to fix, maybe you can just listen. Instead of trying to analyze, maybe you can just sympathize. I just made that up right here. I'm going to make a, a bumper sticker. That was a good one right there, right? Don't just analyze, sympathize. Trademark. All right, right there. Encourage you to do this. As we're going on here, uh, the P, peacemaking. She wants you to say, I'm sorry. This is an interesting one. Paul will talk about this in Corinthians. This is a little phrase that he uses here. Yet those who marry will, not might or could, will <laughs> have worldly troubles. Not just in the world, but I, anytime you put two people together, any two people there's going to be conflict. How much more when these two people are sharing with each other in the most intimate, emotional, spiritual ways, there's going to be conflict. Generally speaking, again, I'm going to use a lot of generalities here. Generally speaking, when men get into a disagreement, we want justice. We want to get to the truth of the situation and we will fight tooth and nail to get to it. We will fight to win. Generally speaking, women want peace. They want to, if need be, go through the conflict, but in order to find resolution and harmonious living. Now, this is interesting. Guys want justice. Women want peace. What happens when you put them together? <laughs> you see some of the sparks starting to fly. And interestingly enough, whenever that happens, I have to tell people, listen, conflict is not a sign of an unhealthy marriage. Your unwillingness to deal with conflict is a sign of unhealthy marriage. Conflict is inevitable. But the question is, dealing with a conflict must be a priority. And so the encouragement that I give to guys is, are you willing not just to get to justice, but are you willing to seek peace? And one way in which you can find peace, guys, is by willing to say, when needed, <sighs> ready? I'm sorry. Maybe we should practice that together, all right? On the count of three, just the guys, let's see how we can do. Ready? One, two, three. I'm sorry. See how hard that was for us? I mean, there's like pulling, pulling teeth. It's hard, even when you don't have to do it. But guys, it may not be that you're sorry for the issue. Perhaps you think, I'm right on this. I'm totally right. But guys, ask yourself this question. Is your attitude right? Is the way that you're talking to your wife right? Is the manner in which you're discussing the problem with your wife right? So you can say all the right things, but you can say it in all the wrong ways. And brothers, let me encourage you, realize both are called to be honorable before God and before your wife. And so you may need to seek peace by saying those words, I'm sorry. Can I tell you, I've been in so many counseling situations with husbands and wives where I You've seen a husband recognize how he's hurt his wife. And when he says those words, it just breaks all the walls. And I mean a genuine sorry. Not like the sorry my kids often give to each other. When one hits the other, I say, say sorry. Sorry. You know, not one of those begrudging sorries. But one that understands I've deeply offended this person and I need to reconcile myself to them. Or as Peter says, let all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, Humble in spirit. Guys, you need to take the lead and seek peace in your marriage. This is something we need to be willing to do. And sure enough, this idea of loyalty comes into play as well. She needs to know you are committed. Or as the song of Solomon says, you alone are my love. Now this is interesting. We especially... When we live in such a culture that is so sex-saturated in movies and media and just culture in general, men, generally speaking, are tempted visually in many different ways, emotionally in a number of different ways. You know, there's an interesting passage in, in Job, um, Job 31. If you're, there's a passage where Job says, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at another woman. And I thought it was always a great verse because I often tell it to guys, to myself, when you're in sexual temptation, dial 311, Job 311. <laughs> Make a covenant with your eyes not to look lustfully at women. Then I realized, you know, Job lost everything except one thing. 
He lost his health. He lost his children. He lost his livestock. He lost everything. What's the one thing that was left behind? His wife. And do you remember what his wife told him to do? Why don't you just curse God and die? And can you imagine Job thinking, I lost everything. And okay, now I got to deal with this. In the midst of that struggle of losing everything and having a wife who's now discouraging him, Job still makes a covenant with his eyes not to look lustfully at another woman. That is loyalty. And guys, we are being tempted in every direction, whether it's on our phones, whether it's in media, whether it's in culture in general. Your wives are looking to say, are looking for you to show your loyalty to her. Not just physically, because the reality is we're all tempted. But the question is that in your temptation, in your temptation are you committed to your beloved? That's what she needs to hear. She needs to understand that you are with her. I don't know if you heard a number of years ago, an individual by the name of Pat Robertson. Um, he has a TV show. Uh, to be honest, I don't really recommend a lot of what he says. But a question was asked of him one time. Uh, a, a viewer posted an email asking, listen, my wife is suffering with Alzheimer's disease. And mentally, she's gone. I, I feel lonely. I feel that I should move on without her and find someone who can make me happy. What are your thoughts? Well, Pat Robertson looked at that and he said, you know what? I think it's okay that you leave your wife. I think, yeah, death, Alzheimer's is like death, so you should just leave her and go find someone to enjoy your last days. And can I tell you, in my opinion, that is wicked and evil counsel. Because not only the commitments we made at marriage, for better or for worse, for in sickness and in health, is being violated, how is that a testimony to the world? In fact, I'll give you even a better testimony. Robert McQuilkin, who was the past president of Columbia International University out in South Carolina, the president of this great institution, a wonderful theological, biblical scholar, written and, and enjoyed internationally. His wife also had Alzheimer's. And he made a decision that when she started suffering, when she really started declining, he, at the top of his career, resigned to care for his wife full time. People were amazed. What? Can't you find other people to do it? Can't you hire others? He said, yeah, I can, but she's my wife. What a testimony of loyalty. In fact, the decision, he said, was made 42 years ago when I promised to care for Muriel, his wife, in sickness and in health till death do us part. In fact, a friend of his, in referencing what he saw with Dr. McQuilkin, he said, you know, almost all women stand by their men. Very few men stand by their women. But men, can I tell you, this is one great way you can show your love. Stand by your woman. Show loyalty, especially as you are tempted in every situation to show loyalty to the one you love. I encourage you to do that. Lastly, um, it's encouragement of esteem. She wants you to honor and cherish her. In fact, we go back to that passage in 1 Peter chapter 3. Live with your wife in an understanding manner. Show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, I think this is really fascinating. I, I, I've actually said this to some young students that are married on campus, and some of them might say, you know, I feel my prayer life is it's just not working. I don't feel God's hearing me. I don't believe my, my prayers are being answered. And sometimes I'll ask them that question. Oh, you don't feel your prayers are effective? How are you treating your wife? And they'll do a double take. And they'll say, no, no, I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about prayer. To which I pull this verse and I'll say, oh, no, 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 no. The two are directly linked. If you live with your wife in an understanding manner, if you show her honor, that has a direct effect, men, on your prayer life. The encouragement of scripture is that we esteem her. Oftentimes, can I say even for my wife, who we, when we try to deal with the struggles of our family, listen, we love our kids. We are so blessed to have them. But as we struggle to deal with them, sometimes we feel we failed 
that we haven't done as we should. And I know this is a real struggle for my wife as well. And at times what I have to do is help her understand, listen, as a mother in the big picture, you're doing awesome. But in the bigger, bigger picture, listen, you are still loved and esteemed. You're not defined by your kids and their attitudes. We're defined by how God looks at us. And early on, I wanted to make sure that I, I'm constantly doing this. I learned this from many other men who have, who have who've done great ministry before me. I remember one gentleman saying how whenever he was speaking, he had to learn quickly not to use illustrations of his wife in a negative light. Even if they were applicable or funny, he always made it a, a mission to never use his wife in a negative way in any public situation. He wanted to esteem her, to hold her up as much as possible. Her husband also rises up and praises her. This is what you husbands need to do. May I encourage you, if you get excited about sports, awesome. Write a Facebook post about that. If you get excited about some political event, wonderful. Tweet that and encourage other people. Guys, but when's the last time you posted anything awesome about your wife? When's the last time you just went out of your way to say something worthy, esteeming of the one God has blessed you with in whatever situation or context you're in? I encourage you to consider doing that. And we all need that encouragement, right? To esteem our wives in the way they deserve. Let me stop there for a second. Guys, I've been beating you here a little bit. Um, but my hope is that it's taken in love because I am right there with you. I need, that's why I love teaching because I hope it helps you because I know it helps me. I need to hear this, but let me stop here for a second. Any questions or thoughts or comments, anything else that, that comes to mind for any of you? And again, like I said, we can have some time later if you want to stop by and talk, but Guys, again, I start with you because you are to lead. You, it is your responsibility first to be the leader in the home. So that's why I started this with you. But again, there is the other side as it relates to the women. And so ladies, if I can now encourage you, if the husband's joy is to love his wife, and these are some examples, ladies, wives, your joy is to respect and submit to your husband. And I hope these are some ways in which you can do that for him. And the acronym is used chairs. The first one is conquest. Appreciate his desire to work and achieve. I have a friend of mine who recently lost his job. And um, he's, he's struggling. He's trying to find a new position. He's had to sell his home. And he's moving in back with his parents. And I was talking to him one time. And he was telling me how his wife, with all good intention, came to him and said, you know what? You may not have a job. We may not have a lot of money. But babe, we got each other. And he said, you know, I so understand what she was trying to do. He, she was trying to encourage me about the relationship. But he said to me in private, he said, but honestly, I want to work. I love my wife, but that love is not going to pay the bills. <laughs> that love is not going to put food on the plate. That love is wonderful, but I, I want to work and provide for my family. And sure enough, I think this is because of what we see early on in Genesis. This passage where the Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate and to keep it. Now again, I'm going to say this in a general manner. Generally speaking, we all work. But I think the work that men and women do is different. This is not to say that women can't work outside of the home. I know many capable and intelligent women that work outside of the home. But I believe, my opinion on, on understanding God's word, is that women's best work is done within the home. Specifically, if the Lord should bless them with children. I think there's a natural community and link between mothers and children that God has designed in a wonderful way. When my kids get hurt... They don't usually come running to dad first. If mom's not there, maybe they'll take it. But I'm a cheese now here, so they'll go to her first, right? There's a natural affinity between mothers and their children. And the work they do, I think, is generally understood best within the home. But then when you look at men, men are also designed to work. But I think the work that men do, it's not to say they forget the work at the home, but understand it's also this other work. Now, we don't live in an agrarian society, I realize, but the reality is, is that we need to be willing to work. And ladies, let me encourage you 
to appreciate the work your husbands do, to value their work, not to demean it, whether they are a CEO of a Fortune 500 company or whether they're pushing a broom in that company. It's work. And my encouragement to you ladies is to value that work. Listen to his work stories. Encourage him in the work that he's doing, the progress he's making, the way it's providing for your family. This is something he needs to hear. Understanding that the inborn natural desire of men is to go out and work. To conquer the challenges of this world. So I I found this passage in Proverbs. A wife of noble character is her husband's crown. I think the idea behind this is that a husband can find honor, as it were, in his wife who encourages him in this way. And, And the encouragement is for you ladies, for you wives to pursue that, to encourage that in terms of his desire to work. Let's go on here to to hierarchy. We've got about 15 minutes here. Appreciate his desire to protect and provide. This encouragement that we see out of, out of uh, Ephesians 5. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, I understand some people read these passages. They see husbands be the head, the leader. Wives, be submissive. And they think, that Bible is so male chauvinistic, right? It is so antiquated. It has nothing to do. Look at all the abuses that have happened between men being leaders and women trying to be submissive. And one of the things I think we need to admit is, unfortunately, yes. There have been some terrible abuses using God's word as it relates to men and women in marriage. But my encouragement is don't let the abuses of culture minimize the truth of scripture. Don't let the abuses of culture minimize the truths of scripture. When scripture says, let the husbands lead, let the wives submit and esteem him, let's follow scripture. And in fact, one way, ladies, you can do that is appreciate his desire to protect and to provide. When Ephesians says, men, you are the head, ladies, submit to that head, right? Be willing to to follow that. His desire to provide and protect is a good thing. (laughs) A number of years ago, when we just had one child, when Elias was only a baby, we were sitting around one winter night, and I remember hearing this large, large bang outside the window, that sounded like a gunshot to me. I got up from my, and I looked out the window. I'm looking around, seeing if I could see it. And again, I hear it, bam. As soon as I heard the second one, I said, Jen, get the baby, go into this room. All three of us go in the room. I close the door. But then I realize, what am I going to do if someone comes in? I usually have like a little bat beside my bedroom, but we were in the baby's room. And so I'm looking around, I'm like, if someone walks in, what am I going to do? How am I going to protect my family? And all I could find at that moment was this stool that was sitting there beside the bed. And so I picked up that stool and I said to myself, if someone is coming in to hurt my family, they will get this stool. I, it would have been a funny picture there, me holding a stool up like this, right? Because... It looks silly, but understand, my, my drone was pumping at this moment, and I wanted, I wanted to protect my family. I still have that desire, right? It, someone cuts me off when we're driving. Oh, the old flesh rears its ugly head, and I wish I'm driving James Bond's car where I can have missiles coming out at that moment. Because it's not just about my van. I could care less about my van. It has lots of dings already. But you, you endanger my family? That is where I draw the line, Right? I encourage you to understand this is a God-given, I believe, innate responsibility God has given to men. And ladies, learn to appreciate. Don't take offense at that. Can I tell you, just last week, we live in a culture where ladies are offended when men want to provide for ladies. We were on a train. I was taking our kids to a baseball game in Toronto. And there's tons of people on the train going back. And there was this older lady. She was probably in her 80s or so. I thought, oh, of course, I'm going to let her sit. So I stand up and say, man, please have a chair. And she looked at me. No, thank you. Like she was offended that I was trying to provide for her a chair. To which I said, ma'am, I'm not going to force you, but I'm standing the rest of the ride. (laughs) And she finally begrudgingly sat down. And I'm thinking in her mind, she's thinking, I I don't have to take a man's chair. I can stand if I want. I may be adding words to her mind. I don't know. But we live in a culture that's offended when men try to provide for women. Women, let me encourage you. Be thankful that your husbands are trying to protect and provide for you. Encourage them and admire the realities that, that comes with that. 
understanding that this is a responsibility given to us by God's word. If anyone, and anyone is in reference to men, does not provide for his own household, he is worse than an unbeliever. This is what God has given us as a responsibility. So women, let me encourage you to encourage your men to do that. Hold them up in this desire to protect and provide for you. It's a wonderful thing you can do to show them respect. All right. Let's go on. We got a few more here. Authority. Appreciate his desire to serve and to lead. And we see this in a number of ways. This encouragement, do not allow women to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands. Again, this, this information is, is so antiquated in our culture today, is it not? Some women read this and they think, I will not be a doormat to a man. I'm an independent woman, a strong woman. The realities of this start coming to play where we're equal. Let me say this very clearly. Men and women are equal. If that's a surprise for you, let me say it again. Men and women are equal. We are both heirs of grace. But equal, yet different. This is something I try to tell my kids quite often, right? Especially with my sons as it relates to their sisters. But dad, that's not fair. I said, yeah, it's not fair because you're different. I do have a different standard for my boys as it relates to my girls, right? I expect the boys to act this way. The girls can do whatever they want. They got me wrapped around their finger, right? But they're different and that's okay. Difference does not mean inequality. But understand, women, may I encourage you to realize that your willingness, hear that word, your willingness To be submissive to your husbands is a wonderful way to show him respect. And may I say, your willing submission takes great strength. The reality is you are exemplifying what Jesus did for us, is it not? He who had all the glory and majesty of the universe humbled himself to serve us. That meekness takes great strength. And, and, and sisters, you have that ability to be willing to submit yourselves to the authority God has placed in your life is a wonderful way to show this encouragement. Support his God-given role as a leader. Praise his good decisions. Be gracious with his bad decisions. Obviously, ladies, we're not asking you to follow him into sin, into ungodly areas. But even in those areas you might not agree Are you willing still to be gracious? Maybe express your concern, but nevertheless be willing to follow his lead. I remember early on when we bought our our home, it's a fixer upper. And so sure enough, there's always work to be done in home ownership, right? And I was trying to put a new tub surround into our shower. I'm not a very handy man, but I'll try anything once. And I was trying to get this tub surround in, trying to get the corners in and everything perfectly. And it just wasn't looking right. And my wife expressed some concern and she said, I don't know if it's totally right. I said, listen, I think it's the best I can get it. And you know what? It really wasn't. But my wife, for the next months, every morning, stepped into that shower and had to look at that terrible work I did that eventually started peeling and water started getting behind it, yet she never said a word. She willingly just stepped into that shower, had to see that, and submitted to my bad decision. And eventually I called her dad who came and helped me put in a new one. (laughs) Because I needed help, I mean, I'm sorry, that's the thing I had to learn, remember? But I so appreciate my wife and her willingness just to follow my lead, even when my lead was not leading in a good direction. It wasn't a big issue. It was a tub surround, right? But ladies, may I encourage you that you have an opportunity to submit to that leadership and show respect and honor to your husbands, even when it doesn't make sense to you, but to trust God by trusting your husband. It's a great opportunity. Come to insight. Appreciate his desire to analyze and counsel. You remember how I said before, um, for, for you guys, when it comes to your ladies and the struggles, a lot of times they don't need a fix. They need an ear. Don't just try to fix it. 
ladies, can I now talk to you? Be willing to uh, bend his ear, but be willing to also listen to his counsel. (laughs) He is, we are, as men, we desire to try and work things out. And can I tell you, this runs contrary to the way culture presents men in the home. Let me ask you this question. For those of you that may watch TV or engage with some of the culture that way, can you think of any TV shows that are either on TV now or have been in the past years where the husbands are presented as buffoons, as idiots, as people who are always making mistakes that the wives need to clean up? Can you name some of those TV shows? Anyone know of any? The Simpsons, right? Homer Simpson is this complete buffoon who doesn't know anything. Can you think of anything else? Currently or past? King of Queens, Queens, this large guy who's always making mistakes. Comic joke, right? Married with children, children, Al Bundy, back in the day, he just sits on the couch and does all kinds of weird things. Say again? Malcolm in the middle, right? Oh, the middle, right. Yeah, another one where there are tons of these TV shows. The other ones I was thinking of was Home Improvements or Everybody Loves Raymond, Modern Family, Family Guy. There's tons of these TV shows where the dad is this inept, moronic, stupidic, stupidic. See, I'm doing it right now, too. (laughs) Stupid idiot who's unable to do anything and we need the wife to save them. Wives, can I encourage you not to believe that lie? Understand that God has given you a husband who is not perfect, but God has given him insight and given him wisdom to be able to think through the problems of life. In fact, when I look at a passage like this in Proverbs, remember, Proverbs is written by a father, Solomon, to his sons. And he encourages them to know wisdom and instruction to understand words of insight. A marriage needs her intuition. You might have heard of female intuition. I don't deny that might be a reality. But may I encourage you, it also needs his insight. In fact, I find this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2 interesting. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman. I take from that that the encouragement is that women need insight, right? Right? And I think this was part of the problem, even from the garden. I think Adam, in some ways, abdicated his responsibility of insight when the temptation came. When that serpent was whispering into her ear, go ahead and take it, he should have been there giving his insight, saying, get away. (laughs) Step away from the fruit. Women appreciate his insight. Value the wisdom that God is giving to you. His empathy can come through problem solving. And so you need to be willing to applaud his solutions and the insight God has given to him. Just a couple more minutes here. We'll finish off with these last two. Relationships. Appreciate his desire for friendship. I appreciate how it says it earlier in Genesis, right? When Eve is made, this is the rationale of God. I will make a helper. A helper. Not just a lovey-dovey, that's not in the original Hebrew, all right? Not just someone where they can look longingly into each other's eyes and whisper sweet nothings. I'm sure Adam and Eve did that, but in the great wisdom of God, he created Eve to help. And so women, wives, let me encourage you to know what it means to help. To be willing to engage, not just in intimate relationship, but may I say, even in friendship. In fact, I take from this verse in Titus, this encouragement to older women. Older women, you are to instruct the younger women. What's the instruction? To love their husbands. Interestingly enough, we talked about this just in the session earlier. The word that's used there is phileo. The word that we use for brotherly love or friendship. Older women are to teach the younger women to be a good friend to their husbands. I think that's a good translation of that text. Be willing to enter into their lives and to be willing to grow in relationship as a friend, as a partner. And I think then saying, this is my beloved and this is my friend, right? I don't know if any of you have ever seen the the TV show, A Band of Brothers. It it was a, a, a show on HBO about... World War II soldiers fighting through Europe. And not just the fights, but the relationship that developed. Hence the name of the series, A Band of Brothers. 
how they formed relationship through the conflict of life. May I encourage you that this is something that you can do in marriage, wives, that you can not storm Normandy, but maybe storm life together. That you guys can work together. I have a dear friend of mine who unfortunately ended her marriage and divorce. And I remember coming to her later and asking her, you know, how things were going. And, and, and I never forget what she said to me. She said, you know, the thing I miss the most is that I get to do life with someone. I, I miss not having someone to do life with. I thought that was a really both sad but also insightful way of thinking about it, that she didn't have someone to go through life. And, and wives, let me encourage you, come beside your husband. Encourage him. Don't just try to talk it up, but sometimes just engage in his activities. Allow him to do things alone sometimes so he can be energized to do things with you as well. And I think this is yet another way, wives, women, in which you can show true respect and honor to your husbands. And so then let's finish with this last one on sexuality and we'll just uh, finish it there. No, I'm kidding. We got to talk about this. This is an important one. Even though this is not something we often talk about in culture, I realize this is an essential aspect of marriage. In fact, a lot of times when I'm doing marriage counseling, when a couple, a husband and wife has come to me and are struggling, when we start talking through things, I inevitably do ask the question, how is the intimacy in your relationship? And I'm not trying to be voyeuristic. I'm not trying to get into details I don't need. But sure enough, research has proven this time and time again. When there is a lack of intimacy in the marriage, that is an indicator of a struggling marriage. Intimacy is an indicator of closeness. It's intended to be. That's how God created us. That the physical union between a husband and wife is to be an, an expression of the emotional and spiritual. A husband will leave, will cleave, and what's the end of that verse? And shall become one flesh. That's physical, that's emotional, that's spiritual. Understand, women, this is one of the opportunities you have for your husband is to show him the opportunity to fulfill. This goes both ways. Again, but I'm making a general statement. Generally speaking, men desire more intimacy than women. In fact, I found a number of times when there's struggle that women sometimes use sexuality as a tool against their husbands. I've had women who have said to me, listen, I, I'm not going to be intimate with him unless he does this, this, and this. Can I say that is a terrible thing to do? They use that as a tool, thinking it will change him. And what it does, it enrages him. It frustrates him. And then he finds that release in all the wrong areas. In fact, that's what scripture says, right? It says, do not deny yourself, lest you give Satan an opportunity. Come back together. And wives, let me encourage you that... The, the relationship, the physical relationship that you can engage with your husbands is a wonderful way of showing him respect. In fact, sex is, a sim, is symbolic of a man's deeper need of respect. So respond to him sexually. Understand he needs sexual release just as much as you need emotional release. Wives, this is just as important. But never use sex as a tool of manipulation. To me, the encouragement of Proverbs, as a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. I read this in a book. I was joking with my wife about this. How, you know, sometimes, again, men, we're, we're just wired differently. Literally, physically, we're wired differently as it relates to intimacy and our desire. You know, this, this one guy, he was writing this about this couple that he was saying and how a lot of times this couple he was working with, the husband says, you know, when he sees his wife coming out of the shower, he thinks, oh, he gets all excited, right? Woohoo! Uh, oftentimes when the wife sees the husband get out of the shower, she's like, stop dripping all over the floor. <laughs> There's a different way of looking at things, right? But that's just how we're wired. We're different that way. And wives, may I encourage you to realize this actually is a way in which you can show respect and honor to your husbands. This is the way that this is intended to be, right? 
However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respect her husband. The encouragement of the text is that it's not just husbands do as much love as you can, wives respect as much as you can, but they actually work together. That when you love husbands, when you love your wives, that does something to her. It motivates her. It encourages her to do what? To respect you. And wives, when you are motivated to respect, it does something to him. It motivates him to love you more. And this is how this marriage relationship is intended to grow, is intended to expand, right? I remember when my brother got married, I'll finish with this. I remember at his wedding reception, he was recounting how um, the, the individual who performed the ceremony said this. He said, you know, I've been married to my wife now for 40 years and I, my, my love for her just grows every day. My brother was reflecting on that at his reception. He said, I can't imagine what that means. Because he was there on his wedding day looking at his bride and thinking, this woman is incredible. I love her so much. But you're telling me that the love I have on my wedding day can actually get better? Are you saying that as much as I love her right now in all her beauty and all her glory, you're saying that love can get deeper as we get further along? And those of you that have been married for a while can all, I hope, in God's grace can say, yeah. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I remember the day my wife came from behind those doors. <laughs> I started tearing up, I'm starting to tear up now because I thought, oh, she's beautiful. She was way down the aisle. I could hardly see her. But she's beautiful. I know when she gets here, she'll be even more beautiful, right? I got so excited. But I look back to that day and I realized the love that we had then was awesome, but it's only been growing. And I pray it's because God is impressing on our hearts that I want to be the, the man God has called me to be and love my wife as Christ loved the church. And I know my wife wants to obey scripture and to honor and submit and respect me as the church does to Christ. They're meant to work together. Again, to showcase the picture. It's not just about us. It's about showing off who God is to our culture, to our world. We, we live in a neighborhood. There's a widow beside us. There's a single mom on the other side of us. There's a single mom in front of us. There's a single man over here. This couple just got separated. There's another single guy behind us, and behind him is another single mom. I literally live amongst widows and orphans. We are the only married couple in our neighborhood there. But they're watching. They're watching to see how my wife and I respond to each other. So we appreciate your prayers. Because we want to be a testimony of love, of respect, so we can show off the glory of God.